Thank you for joining us on this episode of MSP 1337, a podcast dedicated to helping MSPs and their clients navigate cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is a journey, but it doesn't mean you have to travel alone. I'm your host, Chris Johnson. And before we get started, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, PCMatic, endpoint security built on a zero trust default deny philosophy, allowing only trusted sources and blocking all the rest. Lightweight, simple to deploy, easy to manage and compatible with all major antivirus products. Find out about PC Matic's unique lead sharing program for MSPs backed by a primetime national TV campaign. Together, we bring advanced security solutions combined with more than sales enablement. We bring actual leads. Find out more about PC Matic by visiting pcmatic.com slash MSP. Now on with the show. Welcome, everybody, to this episode of MSP 1337. I'm joined this week by Marcus J. Renham, author of The Myth of Homeland Security, co-founder of Tenable, and now in his latest adventure, he is a bladesmith and woodturner. Welcome, Marcus. Hey, thanks for having me. Hey, so as I had said in our previous conversations, uh, I read your book published back in 2004, I think. Uh, It's a post-9-11 look at everything that is and is yet to come perhaps in 2004. And there was one statement that just stood out to me that I think is really important for anybody listening. And that is, what is the motivation for a systems administrator that needs to protect the environment that they're responsible for? And I I feel like this is just like a, a launch point because there's so many things that we can talk about. But if we just start there and you look back to sort of some of the things that you shared with me and looking forward, uh, all the things that came true, perhaps, what is from then that still holds to be true? We've talked about that versus uh, maybe some things that we are getting right that with some proper uh, nudging and shifting, we might be able to do a whole lot better. Okay, well, that's, that's like a loaded question, topic, but yeah. Uh, having motivated systems administrators who are professionalized and who see system security as a, an aspect of system reliability, that to me is really the issue. You know, and, I, and I've talked to organizations and the conversation goes along the lines of, you know, we don't want to spend all this money on security. And I go, well, you spent all this money on having redundant routers and redundant internet connections. Actually, security is, is just another aspect of system reliability. And why don't you, you know, just kind of think about it, think about it that way. It's a, it's a procedural issue. Take the word and, out of security. Yeah, leave it out. Just talk about system reliability, right? Because insecure systems are unreliable systems. Right. You can't, you don't, you can't ride on a roller coaster where you, your, your control, your PLCs aren't locked down. Um, you know, I, you know, I went to an amusement park the other day and there was, uh, there was, a, a an amusement park ride and the, the controller was running Microsoft windows and I, I refused to get on it. I want to see Siemens PLCs. <laughs> I didn't want to get into a complete system audit, but I'm not getting on a roller coaster. That's just got crap software running it. Um, does it blue you know, screen when you get to the top of the first loop or. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it, it's just, it's a reliability thing, right? Because what that shows me is that the people who built that were not concerned with reliability. Sure. If you're concerned with reliability, you spend a little bit extra money. And so the other thing that's going on that, 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 that kind of fits into that is um, organizations are doing cost savings, the cost sensitive in places where they, they fundamentally executive management just doesn't understand how computing is done. I, I don't know if you've ever heard this before. I bet you're going to laugh when I say this. But how many times have you talked to somebody and they say, well, no, we want COTS. We don't want to develop stuff. We're not a development shop. We want some security system that we can just plug in that's going to work. We don't want to have to sit and tune it, and write rules for it. We don't want to have to write Perl scripts or any of that kind of stuff. And they go, well, you know, you do understand that, you know, when you buy Oracle, you're, you're doing software development in the database. You're just using the engine. It's a programming language and you're writing software. In fact, every significant useful IT thing that you do is development. Writing rules 
to configure your Cisco routers so that they form an efficient function, functioning network. That's intellectual property. That's software development. It's programming. You need it's to be not a lot command. better at that. It's the, we, we went from believing that if I wasn't at the command line interface writing code, that I wasn't actually developing something. And that would have looked back, you know, late 90s, early 2000, I was a web application administrator, UX, IX, that was me. And the reality was until they gave me Dreamweaver and UltraDev, I couldn't write code if my life depended on it. Give me a GUI interface. I could write code all day long. Sure. But, the, but, but even if you're, if you're using a GUI, you're still developing right. intellectual property. Totally. If, you're building, if you're building a web app, reliability in the web app is important. And if reliability in your web app is important, security in your web app is important. Right. And you know, organizations seem to want to think that they can just you know, buy stuff, take it off the shelf, plug it in, and it's just going to work. And you know, you know, that has never actually happened. That's not how IT, that's not how IT functions, right? Even um, if it did, they can't build the environment for every single person that might deploy this because you end up with things that are the anomalies because you deployed it in an environment that it wasn't built for. Right. So, so the issue is that systems administrators are, are being expected to be security practitioners, which, you know, okay. But they're not, uh, they're not systems designers. They're not system architects a lot of the time. Right. Um, and organizations, organizations need to architect their IT. Uh, I, blame, I blame the CTOs mostly for this kind of stuff. You know? sure. I don't know how many times I've been in meetings with a CTO and the CTO says something stupid like, you know, well, we're not very good at vulnerability management. We're thinking about just moving everything to the cloud because we don't know how to build a high-performance storage array. And I'm like, well, first off, if you don't know how to build a high-performance storage array, like at the <laughs> managerial level, you're not a CTO. Right. Right. Which would raise the question, do you need one? Right. Well, you, you have, you know, if you need a high performance storage array, then you can have a conversation about the costs necessary in order to build the reliability, to build the, the distributed implementation so that you've got more than one single point of failure. All of those things are part of a conversation the CTO should be competent to have. But I see CTOs go, we've decided that rather than know a thing about storage, we're just going to put everything on AWS. Okay, well, yeah, that's going to work for you. <laughs> but, right. but you're not going to develop any useful skills. I mean, you mentioned the Homeland Security book. Um, shortly after I wrote that, I did an interview with, I can't remember who, and I said something that, you know, seriously damaged my career in the government quarters because I said that, you know, the modern government program manager, all they know how to do is read PowerPoints from vendors. Yeah. Because they actually don't really know anything about IT there. They just, they just read proposals from vendors and they pick the one that has the prettiest graphics or something. I don't know how they, what their algorithm is. Well, that hasn't changed anything, right? I, I would argue that anybody that's checking out a vendor, if the website for that vendor was poorly put together, odds are we've already moved on because if they're going to put little effort there, I would expect them to put little effort into whatever it is that they want to sell me. But the fact, the fact is that a CTO should be looking at that stuff and asking, what does this product do? What problem does how it solve? Much, how much time is it going to take us, not just to implement it, but to maintain it? Right. How critical is it going to be to what we're, what we're trying to do? Are we willing to invest the resources to squeeze the money out of this thing? You right. know, and so so I've done a couple of consulting projects for for clients, including including some very large ones, where you know basically we took classic intrusion detection architectures and we took them out, we dropped them all in the dumpster. And replace them with you. You write some overlay rules for your Palo Alto, and then you turn the you turn the um, application awareness diagnostics on. You turn the destination uh, categorization schemes on, and then you add the user mapping. You dump the whole thing into um, uh, 
uh, system log analysis capability and you look for unknown 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 because you've got an unknown app trying to with an unknown user trying to go to an unknown website it's malware and mm. it's, this isn't rock this isn't rocket science right, right? and and so you know in the case that i'm talking about i was working with a, a visionary um chief security officer who was visionary enough to realize that turning one technology into a data source for another was much more cost effective. And it, it, did, it wasn't rocket science. I mean, at that point, I don't care whether you're writing your rules in Perl or whether you're writing your rules in Splunk or whether you're writing your rules in MySQL, you're, you're writing rules in something. Right. Um, and, you know, you need a process framework around how are you going to how are you going to handle those those uh, outputs from that system, and that's really the tricky part is having the process that allows you to condition the inputs. Uh, conditioning the inputs is the term I use for you know setting it up so that the inputs are as easy to parse as possible. Sure. Right. Right. Um, if you've got a bunch of firewalls and you or you know, load balancers or whatever, and you configure them correctly, you can build an intrusion detection system out of next to nothing and, and a bunch of scripts on top of it. Um, you know, and then and then of course when you when you build a system like that, people ask, well, why didn't you just use Snort? Uh, we could have used Snort. It would have been a tool that we could have used at some point in that point in that process, but it, we didn't need it. We understood what we were doing, right? Yeah. And that's really the issue. People just don't want to take the time to understand what they're doing, right. which to me means that they really, they really don't care about security. They just want it to go away, which I'm I'm fine with. Which I think I think isn't necessarily a, a, a bad thing in the in the tense of so like if, if I'm a managed service provider and my clients are like, just make this problem go away. Um, I, I understand that, but one of the challenges we face in that is. I believe security requires participation. So when they just say, solve this problem, I'm going to continue to do everything that I've been doing before and clicking on that link in my email is one of those things, then that's not real participation. But yeah, I I, I see where you're going. I, I think I'm, I just lost three sponsors, I think, because we told IDS to, to go pound sand. Now, um, so uh, to shift gears a little bit, um, and, and again, I, I referenced the book and I think it's not that the book... Uh, solves world problems, but it, it is a book that should make anybody, if they were to read it today, think about currently, what are we dealing with? And I don't think you said anything in 2004 that either isn't coming true or isn't a reality that we should be uh, using as a, as a tool to help evaluate as we continue to move forward. And you said it over and over again. So one of the things I, I liked that was the reference to the electronic Pearl Harbor. And I bring that one up because this whole cyber warfare and the ideas behind it, you said so eloquently by referencing Pearl Harbor in the, in the way in which Pearl Harbor itself was exploited with regards to, you could just walk through and check out, you couldn't necessarily get on a battleship, but you could see everything that was flowing in and out of Pearl Harbor. And to some degree, and if we look at cyber security today or, or the, the world of the internet, it's kind of the same thing. There's really nobody that says, Chris, you can't go and browse Palo Alto's website or some of these government websites that have a lot of content that tells me how to do a lot of things that I probably should have no business doing. And yet we're still concerned with the unknowns that are tied to us just ignoring the known. Right. Is, that, is, that, is that a fair way of couching it? That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, you know, I, I, I used to get back. So so the, another piece of my bio that we didn't talk about was I was the founder and, and uh, CEO of Network Flight Recorder from 1997 through 1999, uh, which was a classic intrusion detection system that just did network monitoring and then had a, uh, a rules language that allowed you to, to, to process alerts based on the stuff that you found in, in network monitoring. And one of the topics that came up all the time was that, you know, customers would say, we just want something that we can plug in that's going to tell us about unknown stuff happening on the network. 
And I go, I, I can't tell you what's unknown. I don't know what unknown is. That's what unknown means, right? <laughs> hey, so you know what, what it is. <laughs> yeah, what I can do is I can force you to tell me what's known. And then I can take everything that happens and I can subtract known from everything that happens and then put the rest on your plate to look, look at. So if you can tell yeah. me what's okay, if you can tell me what's okay, I can tell you what's not okay simply by subtracting what's okay from everything that happens. And what I found was that customers didn't want to take the time to define what's okay, which utterly horrified me. Because it should. Yeah, basically, you know, I would sit there, I, I would sit there in these meetings and go, what about chief technology officer means not knowing what the hell's happening on your network, right? I mean, you put you put these systems on your network for a reason, I assume. You don't just have people going and slapping systems into racks because it's Wednesday. They had to have some kind of purpose. Are you trying to tell me that you didn't capture what that purpose was when they stuck that system in the rack? Well, <laughs> and they I, think, I think that's that's actually, I don't think that's far off. I think the reality is today, because things are less about the boxes we put in racks and more about the apps we choose to subscribe to, download and use to circumvent or for the lack of a better word, the shadow IT model. Um, I, did a, I did an audit on a company a few years back and it was really interesting because they were struggling with where, where data was being stored. They were concerned that it was just mostly being put local on people's machines you know, the typical, well, I don't have to save to network drive. This is easier, more convenient. So I did an audit on their, on their systems. And I used a product at the time that was in sort of a beta mode called app guru is uh, created by a log, the guys over at log me in. And I started using this tool and I identified that of the roughly thousand employees, the number one location that they were supposed to be storing data was actually number 10 on the top 10 list of where data was being stored. And it was like this mind blowing, like I've got data going places that's not authorized. The Dropboxes, the box.com, all these free apps. I mean, I had things that I'd never even heard of before that were considered file sync share apps. How does the CTO of that company call themselves the chief technology officer? Well, if and that's just it. Data everywhere. They don't know anything. They're ignorant. Right. And I would argue that that's because we've created that. The CTO role wasn't something that we said, let's look for someone with the following qualifications. No, they said, hey, we got Joe over here in HR. He's really not doing anything. We were going to let him go, but he'd make a great CTO. Bring him to the right. table and have him like look at POs and PowerPoints. And we'll call that the CTO. And I think for the last decade, at least in the last decade, we've done a really good job of putting people into positions that are sort of, um, should be very high profile, but in fact, have been put into like, just go sit in that corner over there. We've checked that box. Yeah. I got involved in an incident response, um, uh, back in, uh, 2019, right, right around when I was in the middle of retiring, and uh, the head systems architect, so it was this web application, and they got owned horribly. Their whole infrastructure was out at Amazon, and their systems architect's personal system got compromised, uh, and it turns out that he had basically used all of his personal passwords for everything that was out at AWS, so the whole system was just completely wide open. Uh, because of this guy and this was discovered and there was a meeting and one of the things that happened was that you know the guy was in the process of like he was hiking in Belize when this all went down oh geez yeah and his attitude was well we'll deal with it when I get back and I was thinking uh you may as well stay in Belize right <laughs> don't, don't come back yeah um, you're better would, off there i would have you killed but, yeah uh, but but i didn't say that but right said, you know, what, what what about being the systems architect doesn't mean that I, like, I would have managed to be back in new york by 6 a.m the next day i don't know how right but whatever but was realistic you would have done it i would have i would have done whatever i could have done yeah and i would have been i would have been there to deal with it 
but you know right. it was it was just basic basic screw up stuff and you know i i i don't know how many times uh marcus memos have gone to boards of directors i think i've probably done about 16 board letters during during the course of my career and the i wrote a board letter unsolicited board letter after that that said your biggest risk is 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 this guy well this goes back to the beginning of the book that says a properly motivated systems administrator and i would argue that his motivation was probably highly on that list of money was near the top for him to be I'll deal with that when I get back. Not a big deal. Um, my quality of life is great. And as long as that's not being compromised, uh, then we're going to address that later. Um, yeah. And I think this comes back to you. And, and I say this all the time. You, you said it too, like that your clients protecting the client was what was in both of your best interests, because if it's not, then what are you doing in the first place? Because I can take phone calls all day that someone's going to pay me. That, that's, that's, but that's not why we did it. That's not why I do it. I do it because I want to help solve the problem. And when I can't, I don't want them to be my client when they don't want to listen and they don't want to do what's being asked of them. You know, it's, it's funny because you've said this a couple of times, uh, the it's too much work. Uh, we're starting to see vendor produced vendors products that are coming out that are defined by things like the whitelist versus the blacklist, like for like content filtering and those types of things. And it's interesting because I always get the, man, this is really complicated. Can't we just go with, we'll just block the stuff we don't want them to go to. And I'm like, do you realize that that's like an infinite number of sites versus whitelist and say, from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. on our network, these are the only things that you can go do. And if something by chance comes up that you can't get to, that's needed. Well, by golly, we'll add it for you. Right. Just tell us it's needed. Um, you know, but but th that's another thing that's weird. I mean, you say something like that, and then someone in that meeting is inevitably going to say, but we won't be able to get good people if we block access to Facebook during office hours. Because, you know, kids these days are used to, Facebook, I mean, oh, yeah, you know, they can they can work someplace else. That's fine. I mean, if you want people who are actually doing stuff during right, right, and this is this is utterly mind blowing to Marcus because then there's all these organizations that put all this effort into writing policies that say, you know, don't post yourself giving Nazi salutes on Facebook from your corporate account. Uh, what? Right. Why don't you have? Why not not have a corporate account? and then tell people just you know don't play facebook during the day right because we're There's, not paying you to do that right i and I, I would argue that even your marketing department when it comes to things like social media either they have a very targeted strategy that's limited to specific accounts or they've got their back to that same problem they probably shouldn't be on it either right and that, and that you know it's the same thing it's who speaks for who speaks for whom and this is all stuff that needs to be organized again the chief technology officer of a company should be sitting down with somebody in human resources and somebody else in executive management probably the ceo and going like what is our strategy for how we're going to present ourselves to the public are we going to have a spokes are we going to have a spokesperson um and, and how, how are we going to do that? And then, yeah. and then the other part is, you know, no, you know, it's not very hard to throw a rule into your palo and say, block all social media. Right. And then, and then unknown gets sent to your Splunk, you know, and, and it goes to the Splunk and then someone in the sock will generate an alarm and someone drifts over to your desk and right. says, what are you, what are you, what are you doing right now? You, you know, Stormfront is not where we want people going during the day. Right. It's, it's not rocket science. I mean, I understand if you, well, well, you know, that's also funny because I, I've talked to a lot of people who work at universities and they go, we've got academic freedom, so we can't put that kind of blocking and monitoring in place. Really? You fire people who post on Stormfront from their uh, university account, right? Well, then apparently you can put that kind of blocking and monitoring in place. What, what you're saying is that you're lazy and you're right. just not going to do it until it's thoroughly too late. They've separated protecting from allowing, right? So just yeah. having it open doesn't mean that that's academic freedom. In fact, it could be quite the opposite when suddenly their system is bricked because of where they went. So yeah. Really well, I, used to tell, I used to tell all of my employees 
when you're working for the company and you're doing anything that involves the company in any way, shape or form, you're representing the company. Right. So if you don't represent the company well, you're going to get fired. Which also comes back to the time of day, right? So just because I don't use my corporate account, if I'm doing it during the window that I would be allegedly on the clock, I'm still sort of breaking that and representing essentially the company anyways. I I would even argue that using personal accounts when you're employed, especially when it's in conflict with what the employer represents, you still could be putting yourself in a bad spot anyway. I don't understand why anybody does that. I mean, it, right. it's, 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 it's a weird thing about social media. I think what's happening is that because anyone can say any dumb thing that pops into their head, mm-hmm. they, they seem to think that they should say any dumb thing that pops into their head. And then you get these weird, you know, you get these completely, utterly bizarre reports like that there's, you know, all these police officers who are members of white supremacy groups that are private on Facebook. And, and honestly, Now, the unions protect those people so that they can't be fired. But someone should basically sit those guys down and say, you know, I'm going to do everything I can to get you guys fired so that you don't work for this organization anymore because you're too stupid. Right. Anybody, anybody who's going to risk their job. Right. By doing that. How important is that to you? You just told me. You just told me that, you know, being able to post a video of you goose stepping around is, is worth more to you than making your mortgage. So right. you're, you're too dumb to work here. Right, right. You've, you've cleared that. You've definitely cleared the air on, on that one, right? Like, right. Let's, let's not have this conversation again. But if we do, we've had this one. So we've got it in the books that we can just make it one more. It's, it's, it's nothing, it's nothing personal, right? right? It's nothing personal. I mean, you, what you're doing is very personal to some people, but, but it's nothing personal to us. It's simply that y- y- you just put the dunce cap on. Right. And, you, know, what, you know, what do you expect me to do? So there's a, there's a lot of that kind of stuff happening with social media. And generally, I never even engaged in that dialogue because to me, the stuff is just completely obvious, you know, and I'd see, I'd see people in organizations and they would bypass the organization's security, mm-hmm. right? I, I, I know you probably see a guy sets up a VPN on his desktop so that he can get to ESPN during office hours because someone put a block in place for, right? Well, the reason the block in place is because you're not supposed to go to ESPN during office hours. It's not because we hate sports. It's because we hate people who we're paying $120,000 to, who are goofing yeah. off during in office hours. Which is also a catch-22 because if I, what's the lesser of the two evils? The employee who's got ESPN pulled up or the employee who has found some free VPN proxy that's now backdoored everything back into the company. Yeah, well, the main, I mean, the main, <laughs> the main issue is if somebody is willing to bypass security I'm not trying to be an authoritarian here, but I see that, you know, it's like, it's like taking your seatbelt and going, well, I'm not going to wear my seatbelt the way I'm supposed to. I'm going to tie it around my neck. Oh, right. okay. I mean, it, you know, in, in these days of the pandemic, we've got, we've got this very bizarre thing in which being stupid has been become politicized. Right. And there's a lot of people are, oh, I'm not going to wear a mask because of my liberties. You know, I, I fire those people. I mean, well, it's it's the weirdest argument because we we've established that you can't walk into a walmart and smoke a cigarette and yet we're going to right. take issue with something that's so less controversial really i mean as far as it, what it should be i mean you know heaven forbid we be civil to the person next to us uh, so well, hey, as as well, we're you're uh, obviously stupid so get out yeah. right 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 yeah you're obviously so, stupid so get out I, maybe I should yeah. title that this the podcast. You're obviously stupid, so listen to this episode. Uh, um, <laughs> so as we as we look to wrap up, uh, there was one other thing in the book, and this isn't because it's the book. I think this is just a profound statement in general, and and many people use this term. You know, use more duct tape, right? Uh, if it's if it's broken and I can fix it with duct tape, then it's fixed. Oh. Uh, so you, you said something to that effect about um, uh, the security system essentially being sand and then trying to put, or the system's basically sand and then trying to secure that by putting duct tape around it. And obviously sand doesn't uh, all stick to the duct tape, but um, 
there's a, I, I wrote down this quote, what does the typical IT organization department, or I used MSP, I threw that in there, do when confronted with shoddy security and its systems? And I like your answer, simple, just add more duct tape. So for the MSPs that are primarily the listeners to this uh, show, the thing that I was curious about from you is, and we've kind of said this throughout, that this is not about how much money you spend on security. It's really about understanding what you're protecting and systems reliability. So duct tape sometimes does work, you know, sometimes it does fix, you know, you've seen leather jackets that had a nice little hole in it and you know, duct tape covers the hole. Great, great job there. Um, so as we're wrapping up, you know, some thoughts like that you could part, you know, some wisdom, because obviously duct tape isn't the answer. Uh, simplicity maybe it's is. It's an answer. It's it an is, answer. It's an, it is an, yes. And I think that uh, depending on what color it is, it, it maybe make it a better answer. Uh, but yeah, well, I just. If, if it's your motorcycle jacket elbow, you can put duct tape on that. And it's an answer for that particular problem. If you've got a leak below the waterline of your battleship, that's a structural problem that indicates that, you know, well, battleships shouldn't develop holes below the waterline that are, that are subject to being fixed by duct tape. So what has to happen whenever there's a system failure is there should be a review meeting where people sit down and go, how did this happen? Let's do some root cause analysis. What decisions led us to make this mistake? Was this a mistake? What decisions led us to make this mistake? How, what do we need to do so that we don't make this kind of mistake again in the future? Right. And then the next question is, should we fix it or can we just duct tape it? Do we need to replace it or do we need to, do we need to duct tape it? I mean, it, you know, those, it's a process, right? And what happens yeah. very often is that organizations fall, right? What I just described there, was how to prevent your organization from falling into the sunk cost fallacy. Well, we've already spent this money on this thing, so we're gonna throw some duct tape at it. Well, maybe, right. maybe what you should do is take the lessons that you learned from that thing and then do something else. And one of the points that I constantly beat my clients over the head about is this idea, which is, I think it's pretty much accurate. So think about all the products that you use and love one fifth of them will be gone in four years. Half of yeah. them will be gone in 10. None of them will still exist in 15 years. So if you're a strategist and you're doing information technology and you're trying to strategize about IT, you shouldn't just be assuming that your, your firewall is gonna be there forever. And more importantly, it could suck. I mean, Oracle might buy them, right? You know, sure. Software or whoever. Yeah. Right. You know, so the, you know, so so you have to think about that. So if you're if you're the chief technology officer of a company, your strategy should include things like, well, what if you know, what if um, what if my company winds up being in a nasty competitive situation with Amazon and someone comes along and says, get all your stuff off of AWS right. now, right? What's my, what's plan B? Right. Um, so for every plan, and that's what, that's what I, I, I'm fascinated by about corporate IT because a lot of IT, the whole premise seems to be, let's get it, let's get it working and then don't touch it. Well, it's the whole layers of security. And what I, what I hear you saying is, instead of adding the, the duct tape layer or any other layer for that matter, have you had, have you taken the time and probably should be doing this on a regular basis? I would even go so far as to say at least annually, what is and isn't working, you know, because before we add something else or take something out to put something else in, you know, is this a knee jerk reaction because I don't like who bought company X? Is this a knee jerk reaction because we didn't configure it right? So of course it's the vendor's fault, you know, if I think about what, what you're saying to me, it says, are you at least looking structurally at your environment to say, I have systems reliability and I'm good with that. And I'm making it more reliable by what I'm adding versus I'm not sure it's reliable. We should do a systems check. Yeah. yeah you just have to 
you just have to look at your design and then ask kind of what's the simplest and most reliable implementation that matches my design. I had one client where they were getting ready to spend around a half a million dollars on an Oracle database replication system for, um, so for some transaction databases. And I, I asked, you know, I asked what I later realized was the key question, which is how, um, how real time do the updates to this system need to be? Well, it turned out it was really a transactional record system, not a hard real-time application where the databases all had to be in sync. And so we basically just went, oh, well, if that's the case, then why don't you just simply add a when this field was updated thing to every row in the database, right? And then every so often, because the database really wasn't running under a high load at any particular time, the system was way over spec. Every so often you do a query for all the records that have been updated since the last time that we did this query. And then you save those and push them over to the other system using SCP over, uh, over a public network. Little and then on the other system, on the other system, you insert those rows. And they went, well, that, um, that sounds literally their words were that sounds too easy. You're right. It should sound too easy because it's because <laughs> it's a simple problem. It's really easy. You're defining the American psyche, though. We like to create complexity out of nothing. Right. So I had a uh, I was involved in a, a website setup for a, a site called Comic Wonder, which was a joke website. And the whole idea was we needed to have a couple of replicated databases just so just in case one of the machines went down for reliability reasons. We needed a replication system. The when someone uploaded a new joke, it would it showed up in the system logs, right? Sure. So I I wrote a thing that monitored the syslog and it went, look, a new joke was just uploaded. I'm gonna have CP it to the other two servers. That was the database replication system. It worked absolutely fantastic. It was, you know, 10 lines of code. I mean, it was just ridiculously simple stuff. But rather than having to look at the syslog for all of the transactions in it, you were narrowing down to only look for when a new joke has been uploaded, which obviously it's, simplicity. It's conditioned, it's conditioned input. You put, yeah. you put into your data stream information that you have already tagged Right. And, and then your data stream for your system logs, now, now your system logs become an information bus for your organization, right? Where you can, you can manage that stuff in one location and you can do things that are already mapped because you, you told it what to map. Um, another trick that uh, I've pulled in the past, which works great, you know, let's say you've got one of these next generation firewalls, they're fantastic high performance technology. And what you do is you put overlay rules in there. It's okay, these things can handle so many rules, it, it doesn't right. slow them down, right? So you put, uh, you put one rule in there, it says, if you see login traffic to the machines in the data center, generate a level five alert. If you see login traffic to the machines in the data center that came from our privileged access management system, generate a level 10 alert, 10 being the lowest in this sure. case, right? Yep. And what I just gave you there, two lines of rules in your firewall is a detector for people who are trying to get around the PAM to do administrative access. And that's gonna catch hackers and pen testers. Right. That's, you know, and that's another thing. All of these systems, I don't know how many times I've had uh, this conversation where you go, you know, do you, does your organization, are you subject to penetration testing? I'm not a big fan of pen testing. I think it's generally a waste of time uh, the way it's done by most organizations. They go, are you subject to pen testing? They go, yes. I say, well, do you catch your pen testers in real time? They go, what? I mean, I, I know three organizations that can catch their pen testers in real time. Because they thought about, well, what do our pen testers do? And then what do we put in place on our network to detect that? And it just happens that that's also what hackers do. And right. it, wouldn't it be pretty cool if we could detect hackers? Wait until, right? Most, most organizations 
incident detection algorithm is they read that they've been breached on the front right. page of the New York Times. Right. And it works great. It, it catches it every time. It works. And it's a very high priority alert, right? Right. I mean, but what you want to do is you want to basically have this stuff in place in advance with preconditioned information. Here's another one. Let's say you work in an organization that's got, uh, uh, I don't know, you're something like AT&T, right? And so you own all of these companies, right? What you need to do is that the chief technology officer responsible for all of this stuff needs to say, here are the facts that you need to publish to all of the other member firms in the event that you have a security incident. Right. It doesn't have to be a significant breach. It could just be that, you know, user, unknown went, to, yeah. user unknown went to a malware command and control website. And then, so this goes out over some little information bus, which could be a bunch of syslog servers. I don't care. It could be syslog servers are being picked up by Splunk, right? And so then you can get this alert you're in the sock in a member firm that's got nothing to do with this other member firm that may have just had a security incident, but you get a little notification saying you might want to look at your logs for this IP. Right. Hey, Rick, now, how much does it cost to implement something like that? Nothing. It's just configuring some existing stuff that you almost have. But if you're doing an incident, if you're doing an incident uh, response, that can lower the cost of your incident response by a hundred thousand bucks. Right. And, right. That's and then you more. tell management, right. And you tell management that and they go, huh, why didn't you do this yesterday? Mm, Cause I'm stupid. Yesterday but, I, I mean, was in Belize hiking. I was in Belize hiking. But I mean, that's the kind of thing that that's the kind of thing that good system network administrators should be thinking about is how are we going to build these kinds of systems where you want the system to detect errors that affect it and notify people and do its own self-diagnosis. Well, Marcus, I believe we are running out of time. So I would think that probably in the not too distant future, we should have another episode because this has been great. Uh, Marcus, where can people find you if, if that is okay, uh, whether it's via email or otherwise, to ask questions of someone who has such a, uh, a wide knowledge base of what we deal with on a daily basis? I try not to, I try not to answer answer questions about a lot of this stuff because it's like it's mostly painfully obvious but sure. somebody's got a really interesting question just google my name and 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 you can find my email address very easily uh www.random.com is my website um and uh if you want to see knives and bowls that i've been making i just yeah. turned all the information security stuff off because i don't care about it anymore yeah i saw the bowls they, they look amazing i did not see the knives yet i'll have to go back and check that out uh, again, uh, I, yeah. I appreciate you being on this episode of MSP 1337. Thanks, everybody, for listening and have a great week. Mm -hmm.